भद्रम कर्णे विशृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येमाक्षभिजत्रा स्थिरंग तुष्टवांसस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्वेदा स्वस्ति न स्ताक्षो अरिष्ट नेमी स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओम शांति 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 फ्रॉम टुडे वी आर स्टार्टिंग द स्टडी ऑफ प्रश्नोपनिषद विच इज फ्रॉम द ब्राह्मण पोर्शन ऑफ द अथर्व वेद एंड वी हैव बीन टेलिंग अगेन एंड अगेन ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ शंकर भाष्य ऑन मुंडक एंड ऑन प्रश्न that prashna is a sequel to mundak unless we have studied mundak we are not in a position to understand prashna but now let us discuss today what is the meaning of this sequel sequel is not in the sense of continuation no that something has been told in mundak and further part or continues in prashna no not at all neither is it a repetition so what it is <clears throat> to understand that we must go back to vedas we are studying vedanta but we have to go back to vedas to understand the very position of prashna upanishad now vedas are basically they are divided into three parts sangita brahman and aranyaka upanishads are not a separate part upanishads are sometimes found in the sangita sometimes in the brahman sometimes in the aranyaka so what is the relation of these three parts now let us go back to the word vedas ved means to know so vedas will appear to be knowledge but all knowledge is not vedas physical sciences are not at all a part of the vedas if we know something by the ordinary five senses of the ordinary man i'm deliberately using this word ordinary then and what is science i'm quoting swami ekananda from his essay hinduism and ramkrishna there he says that if knowledge is gathered by the five senses and by logic reason based upon that data brought by the five senses it is physical science physical science some people wrongly understand that physical science some of my friends i heard talking that where Vedanta has reached physical science has almost reached please physical science is rooted in the mud of this earth it does not rise above the senses of the ordinary man and whatever else we find there is a hypothetical logical construction it does not provide it does not assume it does not have the idea at all that the things which it is proposing by logical hypothesis can be experienced this dark hole even an atom or the particles within the atom which it proposes 
are not perceptible by the five senses of man. It appears when it describes that is if we are perceiving them. Photon, neutron, electron, proton, now some God particle. By the name, some people are delivered. It has found God. It has not found God. Some particle with uh, strange properties, they call it God particle. And these particles, according to science, are not to be physically perceived at all. It is only the logical hypothesis which tells about them. So, what is the remaining other knowledge? The knowledge which is subtler, in Swami Ekanda's words, Yoga ja sukshma shakti grahiya. Yoga is the science of spirituality. We may think of karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, and jnana yoga or any yoga. But yoga is the prapti upaya, the method to be followed to achieve the realization of Atman. So if we are following some method of yoga, especially concentration, then we achieve some knowledge, some power is generated in us to perceive things which are real, more real than the things we perceive by the five senses, but which are not perceivable by the five senses. And we come directly face to face with these subtler entities. So this is the basic difference between physical sciences and Vedas. Vedas are the knowledge of the subtler entities. Subtler means which cannot be perceived by the five senses of the ordinary man. I use the word ordinary because the yogis, those who cultivate these subtler powers, they perceive. They are directly perceivable, but not by the five senses of the ordinary man. So this knowledge is Vedas. Now what are the main things perceived like that? And the most important thing is the perception of consciousness or conscious entities. For example, we perceive fire and we take it to be physical something. But the sages whose heart had been purified perceived that there is consciousness behind this material appearance. And another, the mind when it puri gets purified expands. And so they perceived that fire in my kitchen, fire in your kitchen, fire in the ocean, fire in the forest, fire in our stomach to digest food are all one. So it is what we call the cosmic power called fire and there is a consciousness behind this cosmic fire. That is called Agni Devata. So Vedas are basically Devata Jnan. Devatas are conscious within this matter, conscious within this physical energy, cosmic, but they are different. That is, Agni Devata is the god of fire. Varun is the cosmic deity of water. Wherever there is water, wherever there is water, whether in the well or river or 
tank or ocean, there all the waters are same and there, there is a consciousness in that physical substance called water. Water for science is H2O. But in the Vedas, there is a water god and it is called Varuna. So many deities, so many gods. And there is a king of gods called Indra. So this Devata Gyan, now what happens by the knowledge of the gods? Knowledge, direct knowledge. They see, they perceive. Not by the five senses, but by the purified, expanded senses. And then they simultaneously realize that I, each individual, also is consciousness somehow connected with this psychophysical unit. So man is not physical or mental being. Man is consciousness associated with psychophysical unit. So I am consciousness. God is consciousness. So there is a sort of love or relation between us. Now God has, because it is cosmic, it has more powers. I am individual, so I have very small powers. So, the collection mm -hmm. of him in praise of these gods is called so, I mean, that. Somebody's mic is not closed. Huh. So, the collection of hymns is called Sangeeta. <clears throat> now, to complete this, let me tell, there are two more types of subtler knowledge. One is, now, after Sangeeta, because man, individual man, is basically a selfish person. So when you find, just like children, asking their parents to give them this, give them, give me this, give me that. Similarly, this individual man seeks from the gods Please give me this, give me that. Now, when it is a question of giving, then it is a business. You must give something to get something. You cannot get something freely. And so there developed a science of what karma you have to do to get the so and so God pleased. So this is the second aspect of subtler knowledge that the Rishis, whose mind is pure, they see the connection between a particular Homa, a particular worship of a particular God with the result which that will give you. This we can never see from outside. This is not a mathematical equation. This is not poet's imagination. This is seen by the rishis that this karma will lead to this result. So the karma and karma phala jnana is another aspect of subtler knowledge. Now where do we find this? We find this in the Brahmana portion. That means, what do we find in the Brahman portion? This mantra in praise of this God should be used in this sacrifice in this particular way. This is called Vini Yoga. 
Vinayoga means use of the mantra made in the praise of a particular deity. The use of that mantra in a ritual which will make that particular God please and he will give us the result. This portion is called Brahman portion. The third portion is called Aranyaka. <clears throat> Man, when he evolves internally, gets fed up with this gross physical life. Everything about it. The gross means which we handle, the gross results which we get in this world are all seen to be something dirty, not fitting an evolved man. So what does he do? He does not like this city life at all. So he retires into forest. And there he has no physical means to worship God or goddess gods. The supreme God or gods or goddesses, he does not have physical means to worship them. And yet, the mind is still divided into the worshipper and worship, so he worships them mentally. And because of the evolution, the mind is sufficiently strong for example, the Brudharanak Upanishad describes, and many Upanishads describe, that if you do this action, along with this meditative knowledge, then it will give better result than only doing the action without meditative knowledge. And what you get by work combined, ritual combined with meditation, you can get by only meditation. If the mind is so powerful, pure, then only by meditation or mental upasanas, you can get the same result as that by work along with meditation. So this thing is developed in the Aranyaka portion. Now, because we started describing the Vedas, so I have to tell about these three portions. We are connected now between the Sangeeta and the Brahman portion. <clears throat> this Mundakupanishad is found in the Sangeeta portion, Mantra portion, while Prashnapanishad is a part of the Brahman portion. Now, if the mantra leads to some fruit, some result, some external result, then the Vinayoga will tell us how to use it. Now, the Upanishads found in the mantra portion, or oh, let me first describe that. Vedas to Vedanta. So Vedas Sangita portion is Devata Stuti. Now this Stuti, this devotion, mind uses devotion as a power. Many so-called Vedantis do not understand that. And the mistake they do is that they identify Bhakti with Upasana. Please mark it. Upasana is just now I described, is the mental worship, while bhakti or devotion is a force. If you read critically Shankar Bhashya on the Gita, he will tell you that it is bhakti which makes karma into karma yoga. And it is this bhakti which will land you in Jnana Nishtha Yogyata. And this bhakti, 18 chapter 55 shloka, it is this bhakti, 56 shloka, it is this bhakti 
विच विल मेक युअर ज्ञान निष्ठा इन टू ज्ञान सो भक्ति इज अ फोर्स लीडिंग यू इन साइड इन साइड इन साइड टिल द गोल इज रीच सो भक्ति प्लीज डू नॉट आइडेंटिफाइड विथ उपासना उपासना इज मेंटल वर्शिप ए स्टेट ऑफ द माइंड divided between the subject and object which is gods maybe the supreme god also taken as a person bhakti is the force right from work to knowledge of brahman so this bhakti has a purifying force if the mind is not so selfish he does not seek anything while praising god to the extent swami kanda said suppose there is no vasana in man suppose there is no desire in man suppose there are persons who have no desire what would be the form of their religion praising god oh god what wonderful you are there was a sadhu came to dakshineshwar he would now and then come out of his room and looking at the different things of nature would say kya maya hai kaisa prapancha banaya hai that means though you are one without a second see how many plays you are doing so this bhakti has an uplifting power and where it takes man there is a big jump that we found cosmic particularized deities and when there are cosmic particularized deities i am individual consciousness now if our mind is rest further it finds that this cosmic conscious deities are actually not separate does not have separate existence it is one consciousness without a second they would add which appears in these different deities doing different functions or analogically if you speak in us there are eyes meant for seeing ears meant for hearing so like that they are like limbs of the cosmic person now this jump makes a very big difference if it is one consciousness all the gods then i does not have a separate place if consciousness is one it appears as indra chandra varuna agni devata and it appears as i you and he she it cosmic or individual that is vedanta that is vedanta another thing happens and that is devatas are consciousness associated with particularized cosmic physical entities matter or energy but if the mind is rest further and the rishis found one cosmic consciousness then there is no place of matter there is no place of matter at all now let us think in a from that direction <clears throat> brahman is consciousness consciousness appearing as this world through names and forms what is the world forms ever changing and they appear to be separately real because some name is associated with that and when we are not aware of consciousness as ourselves 
when we are not aware of consciousness in outside objects, what we are aware of name and form, that we call physical. We call that as matter. We call that as physical energy, where names and forms are perceived without the perception of consciousness, which is manifesting through them. So, when the consciousness is perceived, realized, experienced, then there is no place of matter or energy. I remember in my class in Rishikesh, when knowing Sadhak asked me, what is this matter, Swamiji? So, matter is only where we do not perceive consciousness, we perceive only names and forms, either matter or energy, physical. So, Vedanta, when it takes the jump that deities are not separate, they are appearances, partial appearances, of the one without a second consciousness, then I, you, he, she, it do not remain, matter does not remain, and the consciousness is one without a second. And we are talking of consciousness, consciousness, consciousness. But that is what exists. When I say consciousness, I know that consciousness exists. And so existence and consciousness are not two separate things. I am aware of some existence. So without consciousness, how we can be aware? So existence is consciousness. Consciousness is existence. And remember, you try to feel I am, you will feel joy there. And if you try to feel I am not, you will never feel happy. And so, happiness, not this happiness. Pleasure is contact between indriyas and object. Happiness is a state of the mind. But there is something called bliss. And that bliss is we get only when we know existence and consciousness. So Brahman is described as Satchit Anandam. Out of this Satchit Anandam, let me now digress a little to make us understand about the Bhakti. If existence and the power contained in it is worship, or we follow that, we get the science of Raja Yoga. If consciousness is emphasized, we get Jnana Yoga. And if we follow the Ananda aspect of God, we flow through Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga, either Anandam, and this Anandam, when experienced, is called Priyam, Beloved, Love. And this, as I said, love is a force. So, please, those who want, I am referring to Brother Nekupanishad 147 and 148. 147 tells us that seeing, feeling, these are partial knowledge of Brahman. And the full knowledge of Brahman comes only when we know that Brahman is myself, Atman. And worship Brahman as Atman. Atma iti eva upasita. And we ask, Please tell us something about Atman which we can catch and do that Upasana. 
So in 148, it is described, Atmanam eva priyam upasit. Atman alone is dear. Atman alone is that which gives joy. Worship Atman in this way. Everything else which we feel, sons and properties and wives and husbands, Atman is only that which is loved. And because Atman is loved, it appears Atman in all, so we love them. So, now, this is the connection between Vedas and Vedanta. Now, if the mantra, I am coming back, if the mantra is in the praise of a god or goddess, then it is used in a particular ritual in this way that is called Vinayoga. Now the mantra tells us only consciousness one without a second, as Mundak has repeatedly told. Then what will be its Vinayoga? But Brahman portion is there. So, some Shankar Vasha first line. I will tell through that now. Hmm? We will read that Bhashya later on, but for the sake of understanding the position of Prashna Upanishad in relation to Mundak Upanishad. Mundak Upanishad is in Sangita portion, Prashna Upanishad is in Brahman portion of Atharva Veda. Mantraktasya Arthasya Vistaranu Vadi Idam Brahmanam Arabhyate. Mantraktasya Arthasya. The meaning of Mundakopanishad. Vistaranu Vadi. Vistara means expansion, amplification, paraphrase. And what is Anuadi? Anuadi is not the translation in the ordinary sense. I experience and I speak in a language that is called Anuad. What I experience, what the Rishis experience, he is putting it in the language. Now understand. Mantraktasya arthasya vistara Anuadi yam brahmanagmarabhate. In one sentence, we have to understand properly, Shankar has given clear hint of relation of Prashna Upanishad to Mundaka Upanishad. So it is not something uh, remaining, like continuation. No. It is not a repetition. But certain items were spoken in brief. Because the Mundaka was more interested in connecting us with Brahman immediately. But certain things were given in principle. And they are expanded here. Now, without the expansion, let me mention another thing. Each Upanishad is complete in itself. So, Mundaka Upanishad Without Prashna, it will give you knowledge. But in place of Vinayoga, if you are getting the details of some of those ideas, then it will be helpful to you. And Prashna also, in the last question, will bring you to Paramatna. Not fully independently, there is a deep connection between Mundak, last portion, we studied that, and sixth Prashna. We quoted there the Kala as quoted in the sixth Prashna. Shankara said that. So, this Prashna Punishad also is independent, but as I told you, it is called sequel because 
if we do not understand those principles of Mundaka Upanishad, this will not convey any meaning to us. Because something has been told, in short means in principle, in brief, in principle. And then details of this is called Vinyog, instead of Vinyog. So, the details of some important aspects told in the Prashna Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad, are discussed in details in the Prashna Upanishad. That is the connection. So now we understand the idea of sequence. Now, let me go into detail about this word Upanishad, because Prashna is a qualifying adjective. What is Upanishad and why it is called Prashna Upanishad? Now, let me discuss that first. We will find on an analysis that all Upanishads, all, are in the form of dialogue, question by the disciple and answer by the Guru. Even where it is not mentioned clearly, Ishopanishad or many Upanishad. It is that one. So all Upanishads are Prashna Upanishad. But why this is the Prashna Upanishad? Here, six disciples are there. Tapasis, Shraddha, Brahmins. Brahmins means searching for Brahman. They don't want anything. Brahmacharis. Shraddha, Brahmachari, Tapasvi is living in forest. And they have reached the state of superficial knowledge of Brahman. We may say, I will explain that later on. And they want, they came together, they discussed, they found that wherever they are stuck up, they are not able to solve uh, the mu mutual answers. And they think, oh, this people are this there. He will answer everything. And they go to him. So six persons putting questions. People are replying to six questions. Each question dealing with one aspect of spirituality. So the whole Upanishad is six questions and the answers. So it is called Prashna Upanishad. Only Prashna and answers. But remember, eh? Prashna is going to be more important by Prashna Upanishad. That tells us that unless the disciple seeks, he does not get the answer. We had found that in many Upanishads, Chandogya also. So, this is Prashna Upanishad. <clears throat> now, let me turn to the second part, Upanishad. And we have to discuss it every time. Upani are the Upasargas and Sat is the root. Now, this Sat is not Satchidananda Sat. It is not existence. It is the root of a verb. And the meaning of that verb is, it has three meanings. Destroying, getting, achieving, and loosening. And it refers to knowledge. Knowledge of the Rishi. If we approach the knowledge of the Rishi by going near it, that is called Upa. And Ni means Nishayana Nishtaya. With a firm resolve and steadfast resolve. If we bring that, go near that knowledge means bring the knowledge near. Absorb that knowledge. Then 
our wrong knowledge will be destroyed forever. We'll get Brahman, our own real nature, and all the bondages which tie us during this wrong knowledge will be loosened. That means they will not be there. This is the, I have to discuss one more point now going deeper. What is knowledge? So, that knowledge is called Upanishad. And why the book is called Upanishad? Only if the book is used to get that knowledge, then it is called Upanishad. Tadarthena granthopi Upanishad iti ucchate. Tadarthena. For that sake. Otherwise, you use the book for chanting, PhD, then it is not Upanishad. Now, what is the meant by knowledge? Knowledge is not information. Knowledge is not intellectual conviction. Let me first define what is our knowledge. And usually, roughly, because language is language. We, we think like that, we feel like that. That is not knowledge. Now, I perceive, I think, I perceive, I feel. Now, I perceive, let us start from here. I see you people. I see this table. I know that I see you. I know that I am seeing this table. Please. Abstractly conceive this. If I shut my eyes, I do not see you. I know that I do not see you. Knowledge does not go away. These are not words. Huh? I know that I do not see you. I feel happy. I know that I am feeling happy. I know that I am not feeling happy. So happiness will come and go, but it contains a knowledge which is the base of all my thinking, feeling, and will. What do I know? Let me now think, what do I know? I know that I am a jiva. I am a subject conscious. And I find myself in this whole world of objects. That is my basic knowledge behind all thinking, all feeling, all will, behind all my perception. That is called basic knowledge of man. I am a subject in this universe of objects. Subject, object, that is the type of my consciousness. Now, if I know I am a subject, now I'll tell you that this knowledge, I use the word now, now I'm telling, this knowledge is false knowledge unreal knowledge. Why? It does not require Vedanta. It does not require Shankaracharya or Sri Ramakrishna or Vivekananda to tell us that the world is false. Let us analyze. If I am stuck up in this body-mind complex, and usually my knowledge is that I am the body, this is the knowledge of every ordinary man and this body. And what is this body, please? A lump of flesh came out of the mother's womb. And it is growing and growing, reducing, growing. So many things are happening. Ashwatha. That means if we critically analyze, it does not stay the same next moment. 
the small child's body and the old man's body. Biologically, even the doctors tell us that after 12 years, each cell of the body is new. It does not happen as a jump, but every day some cell is changing. I will give an outside example to understand. We say that this building, nothing will happen to this building for 100 years or 200 years. If this statement is true, nothing will happen to this building for 100 years, then nothing will happen to this building eternally. Because nothing will happen means the building will be in the same position after 100 years as it is today. Then another 100 years, another 100 years. But the fact is that when you have concretized one pillar and going to next pillar to concretize it, the decomposition has started that moment. But what is the meaning nothing will happen? A perceptible crack does not happen. But change has started. So body is an ever-changing moment-to-moment something. Now my question is, how to call it a thing? The body which was yesterday or the body it is today, the body which was one second before or the body which is now? What is this table? Name is given table, so we feel it is a table. Is it the table yesterday or today or last moment or this moment? A change is going on continuously. Suppose the name table was not there, then this is wood. If this name wood was not there, it would be some particles of matter associated in a particular way. If we go like that, we'll see nothing but Brahman. Existence, consciousness, bliss does not change. The forms change. And because of name, they appear real. So, I am the body is absolutely wrong knowledge. Because I am consciousness. And I have to be something which is permanent, then only I can call it I. And this body is continuously changing. Indriyas are continuously changing. Mind is continuously changing. Mind is vexing and waning. Even this I consciousness is changing. A small child's eye consciousness and the old man's eye consciousness, there is no relation. But change was so gradual, we could not catch it, that's all. If we see in comparison a small child and an old man, then we'll understand that this eye and that eye, no connection. So my eye consciousness is ever changing. So this Ever-changing idea is not right knowledge. I have to be something which is permanent. Secondly, the fun is that this I consciousness is shifting. That means now I am the body. Now my body. That means I am different from the body. I am the mind, my mind. So sometimes I am the body, sometimes I am the indriyas, sometimes I am the mind, sometimes I am the eye consciousness. So shifting, how can it call it real? So on these two counts, I find that my consciousness about myself and world similarly is unreal. Because world, the forms are continuously changing. Because I give them a name, they appear real. Now, there is a third count which will show that 
This is not real. And there we come to Vedanta. The rishis, the sages, the incarnations, what is their consciousness? The best description is in the Gita 13th chapter. What is their consciousness? They directly experience that there is only one consciousness throughout the world. Just now we talk of Vedanta. And that one consciousness appears in I, you, he, she, it, things of the world. And that is the awareness of the nannies. And that never changes. It takes up two forms. In Nirvikalpa Samadhi, they are aware neither of I, you, me, and he, she, it, only consciousness, bliss. And when they come out with their I, they know that this very consciousness appears as subject and object. But same, one consciousness, appearing as subject and appearing as object. Prashnupanishad will tell all these things, huh? beautiful. So, that is why that is real. Another aspect, that what this consciousness has given them in their personality, they are absolutely perfect. They are absolutely peaceful. They do not trouble others. They are not troubled by others. And our wrong consciousness has given us misery, misery, and misery. Our wrong consciousness has given us shata sasra anartha sankulan, evils, bad things of hundreds and thousands of types, because the consciousness is wrong. Now, our knowledge is false, Rishi's knowledge is correct. If we can get that knowledge, that is called Jnanam in Vedanta, please remember. I have used Jnanam in three different senses now. Jnanam means my knowledge, which I found is ignorance means wrong knowledge. Jnanam in the Rishi, which is correct knowledge. Now I'm using third time word knowledge. That means if my knowledge goes away and it is substituted by Rishi's knowledge, then I say I got knowledge. So knowledge used in the Upanishads. I told you, if we approach that Rishi's knowledge, love, nearness, Nishche, Nishtha, then that becomes my knowledge. So, this substitution of today's false knowledge with the Rishi's real knowledge is called achieving knowledge. Knowledge is not information, knowledge is not intellectual conviction, knowledge is this change in the my consciousness of today into the consciousness of the rishis. Now here, I may add something. Appearing in a little funny manner, there are many disciples and there are many types of gurus. So the disciple goes to the guru, usually you'll find that. Teacher, know what I am. And you please accept me as I am. Usual talk of the disciples. Now here gurus are of three types. One guru will say, no, 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 become clean and then come to me. Become pure and then come to me. They are not much useful. And there are most of the gurus, okay, you remain like that, I will remain like that, you give me Dakshina, I am happy. 
This is what we find in the world. But there are real gurus. They say, yes, I have to accept you as you are. How else can I do? But remember, I will not allow you to remain what you are. Be ready for this. That is the real guru. So your consciousness of today and your personality of today will be totally changed. Be prepared for that. So this transformation of consciousness and when the consciousness is transformed, the personality is transfigured. It is not the same person now. Sri Ramakrishna has given the example of a sword made of iron or steel touched by the hypothetical philosopher's stone has become gold. Now only the shape is same. It will not do the work of cutting enemies. It may be kept in the puja room. So the value has changed, the work has changed, shape remains the same. So much transformation happens in the personality if real knowledge comes. So today we have discussed only one point. Ved, Vedanta. False knowledge, real knowledge. Prashnapanishad, sequel to Mundakapanishad. And sequel does not mean continuation. Sequel does not mean same thing. Sequel means supplementary knowledge. And this also independently leads us to Brahmatnyan. So, this is the beauty of Prashnapanishad. And it is set in the form six disciples, all tapasvis, living in forest, brahmacharis, shraddha yukta, but not getting the final result. By mutual discussion, they do not find solution to their problems. And the thought comes to them. It is the law of the spiritual world that the seeking sinner meets the seeking savior. They understand that there is a person called Pipalada. And Eshaha Vaitat Sarvam Vadati Vakshati. That means he is the person who will tell all answers to us. Let us go to him. So, because of that format, the five Sikh people going with their questions to Pipalada. Something intervenes that we shall discuss next time. And then he answers all their questions. And that is why it is called Prashnapanishad. And that is why it is a sequel to Mandakapanishad. We won't understand it unless we know the principles stated in the Mandakapanishad. And so, as we read the first line of Shankar Bhashya, Mantraktasya arthasya mean, meaning given in the Mundakopanishad, which is in the mantra portion, Sangita portion. Vistaranu vadi idam Brahmanam arabhyat. So Brahman usually explains in the sense of Vinyoga. This explains in the sense of giving details. So, we take up on the next Wednesday further Anubandha Chatushtai. We have discussed only the subject matter today. Purpose of life and all that have come indirectly, but we'll discuss all the Anubandhas on the next Wednesday, please. Om Badram Karni Vishrunu Yama Deva Badram Pashe Maksha Bhir Yajatra Sirai Rangai Stushta Vamsas Tanubi Vyashe Madeva Hitam Yadayu Swastina Indro Vruddha Shrava Swastina Pusha Vishoveda Swastina Starksho Rishta Nemi Swastino Brespatir Dadhatu Om Shanti 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 
हरि ओम तत्सत श्री रामकृष्णार्पणमस्